I invite the member for, sorry, the Minister of State for Infrastructure and Transit to lead the House in prayer or reflection. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, for the reflection this morning, I'm going to read uh, from an excerpt uh, from a letter to remind myself who I am by Shane Koizan. Today's lesson is the same as every day before it because the class has been struggling with this assignment. Shine, you must teach this by example. So hand out sunglasses and do not dim yourself for the sake of their comfort. The world is practice in demanding that those who can cast light not do it with such radiance. Show them the falling stars dripping onto the horizon like drops of sky, brewing new days from the fresh grounds of last night. Remember, some people require more light than others. Make extra. Introduction by members. Member for Richmond South Centre. Honourable Speaker, I just want to take this opportunity to wish 10 years later a Richmond firefighter a happy birthday. And I do believe she has requested for birthday wish a 24 hour shift. So I'm asking all the chairman to join me and wishing her a happy birthday. Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. So today, uh, we're honoured to have in the gallery Ron McDonald, the Chief Civilian Director of the Independent Investigations Office of uh, British Columbia. Uh, the Independent Investigations Office plays a vital role in upholding accountability and transparency with our law enforcement agencies. With a commitment to impartiality and thoroughness, the IIO investigates incidents involving police officers that result in serious harm or death. That relationship between law enforcement and our communities is of paramount importance and the work of the IIO ensures that justice is served and public trust is maintained. Would the House please uh, join me in making uh, Ron very welcome today. Colonna Mission. Thank you so much, Honorable Speaker. Well, today I have the privilege of introducing a very special guest to this chamber, my firstborn son. Mikhail Wasilik, or to those who know him as Mick. At 26 years old, that's right, I had him when I was 12, um, and six foot six, just jokes. He stands as a testament to curiosity and ambition, an engineer by profession, but forever the inquisitive child at heart. Mick's presence here today absolutely fills my heart with joy. It's like my two worlds get to collide, but uh, it's he who fills our spirits with hope for the next generation. He's always been the source of inspiration for me, reminding me of the importance of our work here in the chamber, to foster an environment where curiosity breeds innovation, where integrity paves the way for progress, and where change is always possible. Even as a young child, he never accepted anything without doing his own investigation. He was the kid who said, why, of everything but he was also the best big brother to his sister and brother. Mick's journey fills me with pride and hope. He daily challenges me with all of his text messages, yes, every last one of them, um, but especially lunch dates that he uh, spends time with me uh, in. He also inspires me to do my best in building a society that can create space for the next generation's dreams and hopes. They say that you love each child equally, and you do, but for different reasons. I love my Mick, or Meshik, because he was the first to give me the best job in the entire world, being a mom. I'm so happy that you're here today, Mick. Would the House please join me in welcoming him? Mr. Labour. Honorable Speaker, uh, I'm really happy today to introduce to this House my administrative coordinator, Samantha Newcomb, who is in the house today, along with her father, Dave Newcomb. Uh, he's here to watch uh, the question period today from the gallery. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Newcomb um, is a longtime New Democrat. Uh, he's, uh, is celebrating his retirement after 26 years with the Hospital Employee Union. And uh, I, on behalf of uh, his daughter, uh, my uh, administrative coordinator, uh, Samantha, we'd like to thank, she likes to thank him for teaching her the values of hard work and advocating for workers' rights. Please join with me and give both of them a very, very warm welcome. Leader of the Fourth Party. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And in the gallery today, um, we have the Conservative Party of British Columbia's candidate for Courtney Comox, uh, Damon's Grace. Damon is a hardworking fisherman from Courtney, born in Comox. He is an everyday hardworking British Columbian who puts his put his name forward to represent his home community <clears throat> and make change for British Columbia. Would the House please make him welcome? Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. I want to recognize two individuals uh, on behalf of our caucus. Uh, first, Alyssa Brand, who is our Executive Director. Um, this is her last day uh, with us. Um, she is one of the lucky ones uh, that she's got a, a, a lovely, beautiful grandchild uh, in Manitoba. And uh, she gets the opportunity now to move back to Manitoba to be closer to her family, closer to her grandchild. My dad used to say, there's principle and then there's interest. And so she gets to now enjoy the interest. Uh, and, uh, and so we are going to miss her. She's been instrumental in the work that we do. She has uh, supported all of our caucus members through um, good times, through challenging times. And we really appreciate the work that she's done on behalf of caucus. So I want to recognize her. Uh, she's probably in the other room watching. Alyssa, we, we, we were going to really miss you, but I know that the folks in Manitoba are going to gain a really, really big asset that will support them as well. So will the House please uh, thank Alyssa for the work that she's done for British Columbia. <laughs> now, Mr. Speaker, um, we always thank the amazing people that make this House uh, function. But there are some other folks that help uh, make this house function that rarely get recognized. Um, today, we're, I'm losing uh, somebody who's very important in, in my team, somebody who works uh, very well with the teams here. He works well with Ms. P. He works well with uh, Laura from, uh, from our Green Caucus, from Hannah, from the BC Conservatives, and it's Will Martin. Will Martin um, is, uh, keeps the house going uh, while we sit in this house and, and, uh, and jostle and uh, discuss issues. People like Will, people like Miss P, people like Laura, Hannah, they, they all work together behind the scenes to make sure that this house continues to function. And Will is an um, amazing individual because he started working for the caucus as a receptionist. He's done pretty much every single role that you can in our caucus uh, to now leading, uh, making sure the legislative agenda continues to go through. So today is his last day. Uh, working with my team. Uh, I wanted to say, uh, I know uh, on behalf of the Solicitor General who worked with him for many, many years, he shared many stories. I don't think I should share them all and put them on Hansard. But I will say that on behalf of all of us, um, uh, well, I want to A, say thank you for the work he's done and congratulate him as he's now the new Executive Director for the NDP Caucus. I want to say thank you to Will. Enjoy your new role. We're going to miss you on this side. Uh, and uh, please, can the House join me in thanking him for the work he's done. Minister of Children and Family Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and I have two sets of introductions to me. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome Katisha Paul, So, and Alana Reeve to the House. Um, I'm incredibly grateful that they're joining today. Uh, they're here for an important and exciting announcement uh, that we have later today. Katisha Paul is the elected UBCIC youth rep, uh, and I've had the opportunity uh, to connect with her and I'm, I'm very grateful for that connection and a chance to uh, listen, learn, and really grateful to be doing this work together and to continue to work alongside her. So is a member of the Provincial Director of, uh, the Provincial Director of Child Welfare's Youth Advisory Council um, and they have just completed their first year on the YAC uh, and are starting their second. The Youth Advisory Council is uh, a really important group that helps inform the work uh, that the ministry does. And Alana Reeve is a Youth Advisory Council mental health clinician. Um, I, will the House please join me in making all three of these individuals uh, very welcome in this House? <laughs> Member from Nanaimo North Gauchin. Mr. Speaker, um, after 19 years in this House, uh, I can say to everyone, and they all know this is true, that our constituency assistants are the backbone of our service to our community. They are the front-facing uh, presence in our office. They take in so many difficult and challenging casework uh, issues. And I, I once saw a cartoon of someone blindfolded with a dart about to throw it at a wall with tons of labels transportation, education, health care, and the caption said, today I'm an expert in, and that's what CAs are. 
They have to have relationships throughout government and be able to solve problems, and we are the ones, the beneficiaries of their great work. And I'm pleased today to have the two great CAs from my community, Sarah Miller and Pamela, Pamela Gooling, in the, in the House as my guests today. And yesterday I made a statement where I made a joke about an aging hospital being ravages by the, uh, by the wear of time. My friend from Surrey Cloverdale reminded me I may be speaking about myself. But in that statement, I also spoke about a progressive council, North Cowichan, which is partnering with the, the Cowichan Hospital Project to advance housing needs along with that project. And one of those progressive councillors, a previous uh, Green Party candidate, Chris Estash, is also here as a guest. And I, those failing aging eyes don't permit me to recognize the fourth person who's with them. So, uh, but I would, I would like the House to help me welcome all of these fine people from my constituency. Minister of Children and Family Development, one more introduction. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the second opportunity. Uh, also joining us in the gallery today uh, are my aunt and uncle. Uh, Sandy and Shelley Cotton are here, and uh, I'm grateful to have them join us today. Uh, they uh, live in Victoria, and my community benefits from uh, these two wonderful individuals uh, who moved here uh, in uh, the last few years and bring with them their deep commitment to community. My uncle Sandy is a decorated veteran, uh, an ordained deacon in the Anglican Church. He was a professor at Queens. My auntie Shelley uh, changed countless lives uh, uh, over the decades as a teacher. Uh, they're both, as I said, deeply committed to community, uh, volunteers, uh, and uh, deeply committed to their children and six granddaughters as well. So will the house please join me in making them welcome as well. Member for Delta South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would just like to uh, today uh, send out congratulations to Tawasan First Nations. Yesterday was the 15th, 15th anniversary of their treaty, and they're doing some wonderful things out there, certainly adding to our housing stock in Delta. They're actually part of my Delta South riding. So congratulations to Chief Laura Cassidy, my good friend Bryce Williams, and all of their executive council. So please everyone, congratulations to the 15th anniversary of Tawasan First Nations Treaty. Member for Vancouver Kensington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's my uh, little sister's birthday tomorrow, so I uh, would ask uh, everybody in the legislature to please uh, wish her, uh, Lolita Elmore, uh, a very happy birthday. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk. Introduction of bills. Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General. Thank, thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. I have the honour to present a message from Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor. Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor transmits here with Bill No. 17 in Titchold Police Amendment Act 2024 and recommend the same to the Legislative Assembly. Minister. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. I move that the bill be introduced and ready first time now. Honourable Speaker, I'm pleased to introduce Bill 17, the Police Amendment Act 2024. This bill is the first step towards making systemic or systematic improvements to the policing and public safety landscape in BC. The bill addresses three recommendations of the 2022 Special Committee on Reforming the Police Act, seven recommendations from the 2019 Special Committee to review the police complaint process, and addresses legislative changes requested by the Office of the Police Complaint Commissioner and the Ombudsperson. The legislation makes changes to municipal police governance, oversight, and police superintendents, including allowing local governments to determine who their representative will be on their police board, and will allow members of the police board to elect their chair and vice chair. This bill will also allow the police complaint commissioner to call a public hearing earlier in misconduct investigations, and pr proves the, uh, improves the commissioner authority to conduct uh, systemic reviews and investigations to, into the causes and contributors of police complaints. Thank you. 
Members, the question is first reading of the bill. All those in favor indicate aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Minister. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I move that the bill be placed on the orders of the day for uh, second reading at the next sitting in the House after today. You have heard the question. All those in favour indicate aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried. <laughs> Members, before we uh, start the uh, two-minute statements today, I just want to remind all members that the two-minute statement should be very non-partisan. In the last couple of days, we have noted um, that some statements were not very uh, neutral. So please keep that in mind when you are speaking and celebrating or um, recognizing people uh, when you are making two-minute statements. Madam Clerk. Statements by members. Member for Richmond North Centre. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. As the MLA for Richmond North Centre and on behalf of the BC United Official Opposition, I rise to recognise the Qingming Festival, a profound tradition within our Chinese communities. Qingming, or Tom Sweeping Day, observed shortly after the spring equinox, is a time when families across British Columbia unite to honour their ancestors reflecting on the legacies that shape our society. This is a time for me personally to remember and reconnect with my beloved parents, my very dear husband and my only sister in the world. We're living all the fond memories when we are all together as a loving family. This festival embodies our connection to the past, allowing us to commemorate those who came before us. It's a day of remembrance, gratitude, and renewal, inviting us to look back with respect and forward with hope. In this moment, let's also remember the early Chinese settlers of British Columbia whose resilience and contributions are an integral part of our province's rich mosaic. Their spirit and hard work continue to inspire us, reminding us of the strength found in diversity and the importance of honouring our shared history. It is a legacy that reminds us of the importance of inclusion, respect and understanding across all communities that call British Columbia our home. Today, I urge all British Columbians to embrace the spirit of Qingming, recognising the deep roots and enduring bonds that unite us. Let us move forward, committed to building a province marked by understanding, respect, and unity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Richmond, Queensboro. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, since 2017, April has been marked as Sikh Heritage Month in British Columbia to honor the, the invaluable contribution Sikhs have made to our province over the last century. Mr. Speaker, the first six arrived in Canada. They were part of the Army Regiment stationed in Hong Kong. They traveled by train through Canada in commemoration of Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in 1897. I find this fact uber interesting. As you know, I also hail from Hong Kong. And until the mid-90s, the last Sikh regiment in, in the British Army was still stationed at Stonecutters Island in Hong Kong. And our uncle, who also moved from Hong Kong to British Columbia and lives in Coquitlam, Tirith Singh, was one of the last commanders of that unit. Following this initial visit, a second contingent of Punjabi soldiers visited BC in celebration of the coronation of King Edward VII, uh, VII in 1902. They arrived in Victoria on the Empress of Japan on June 3rd, 1902, and their reception was not unwelcoming. Local papers exclaimed, turban men excite interest, awe-inspiring men from India held the crowds. That changed very quickly as permanent immigration started shortly after with the establishment of a Gurdwara in Golden and then the Khalsa Dhawan Society in Vancouver. The next century or so is a story of struggle and incredible achievements in the face of astounding austerity, um, <clears throat> adversity. Despite being met with discrimination and racism, they built flourishing communities, contributed to the growth of our province. Sikhi has one of its central tenets, empathy and caring for others, which translates into a passionate love for social and political justice, and that spiritual guidance guided the community through incredibly hard times. From the struggles surrounding the Komagata Maru to the anti-colonial movements that supported freedom in India, Ireland, and many other colonies, the Sikhs of British Columbia showed up in force. That generosity of spirit 
created unique multicultural communities and enterprises like the one created by Mayo Singh in Paldi. By the way, if you're ever near Duncan, please go and visit. You'll see images of school children from all over the world studying and playing together in a time where the norm was extreme racism and segregation. This month, we're also we celebrating Dusaki all over British Columbia, Surrey, Vancouver, here in Victoria. I encourage you all to go out and visit. Thank you. Member for Shuswap. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Uh, Canadians across the country were heartbroken to hear the news of the Humboldt uh, bus crash on April 6, 2018. Of the 29 bus passengers, 16 tragically lost their lives. Of those we lost, Broncos defenseman Logan Boulay became a beacon of hope through his decision to date, donate his organs, helping to save the lives of six people. Logan's generosity sparked a national conversation about organ donation, inspiring more than 150,000 Canadians to register as donors in the days and weeks that followed. This is known as the Logan Boulay effect. In remembrance of Logan and in honor of the crash victims of their families, April 7th has been designated as Green Shirt Day. It's a day for Canadians to unite in memory, but also to act, to talk about organ donation and to take the significant step of registering as a donor. It's crucial to recognize that each organ donor registration is more than a goodwill gesture. It holds the extraordinary power to save up to eight lives. And this potential magnifies the impact that each of us can make. While 90% of Canadians endorse organ, organ donation, only 32% have formally registered. Despite improvements in donation rates over the past decade, the urgency remains. Every year, approximately 250 Canadians lose their lives waiting for a transplant. On April 7th, I encourage everyone to wear a green shirt, to encourage your loved ones to register as organ donors, and to consider registering yourself at transplant.bc.ca. Thank you. Member for North Thailand. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Campbell River was hop, hop, hopping last weekend, where hundreds of youngsters and their families participated in the downtown Campbell River BIA cele Easter celebration event. It all started at about 11 a.m. and went through the afternoon. The Easter Bunny was alive and well and taking selfies with families all across Robert Osler Park and enjoying pops and snacks by Remax Czech Realty. Down the street at Spirit Square, we saw the peanut gallery on stage with Shoo Shoo the Clown and activities through the square like Bouncerama castles, cotton candy and snow cones, Gateway Foursquare Church Games booth, mini donuts from Canada's Best Donuts, face painting with playful spirits and magical faces, the pretzel guy, the happy camper candy, and activities courtesy of the City of Campbell River program staff. Food vendors like Hot Dogs and Sinfully Delicious were also on site. It was a good time had by all, Mr. Speaker, but I'd like to acknowledge that these events don't happen without a huge amount of collaboration and community support. I'd like to thank the Campbell River community sponsors of 100.7 Raven FM, Associated Tire, the Rotary Club of Campbell River, Campbell River London Drugs, Campbell River Save On Foods, Campbell River Shoppers Drug Mart, Campbell River Thrifty Foods, once again, Remac Check Realty and the City of Campbell River for bringing lots of smiles to a lot of little faces. A big shout out to the Downtown Campbell River BIA Executive Director Jan Wade and co-chairs Heather Gordon-Murphy and Lisa Whitmore for putting it all together and handing out over 300 Easter baskets and bubbles for all the kids. A special thanks for my grandchildren, Mr. Speaker, and for all the kids who participated. You know, sometimes we need to stop, look through the eyes of a happy children, just to see the wonders that this world has. Thank you. Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I felt so distressed last weekend when I heard the news that Mexico City, with a population of 22 million people, is running out of water. I can't begin to wrap my head around what it means when a city that size doesn't have water. Already neighborhoods, and of course the poorest neighborhoods, are dealing with a chronic shortage of water and are relying on either government deliveries or private water cartels selling them water. This is a nightmare on so many levels. After air, it is water that we rely on for our survival. 
We can last a minute or two without air, and we can last only a few days without water. And yet we do not treat it like the absolute precious life-giving force that it is. We misuse it, we waste it, we pollute it, and some treat it like a commodity knowing that when it comes down to it, people faced with thirst will pay dearly for a sip of water. In 2015, when I was area director in the Cowichan Valley Regional District, we had a report from staff that one of our water systems in the north end of the region was precariously close to running out of water. It was May, and we were already in serious drought. As we asked questions of staff, I started to cry. I still feel the weight that I felt that day in my chest. The drought we were in in 2015 didn't end. It has deepened. And yet there appears to be the most magical thinking of all that's happening. The thinking that we can keep doing the same things and somehow arrive at different outcomes than the ones that we are getting now. Today, I feel the same absolutely devastating weight I felt in my chest in May of 2015. Water is life, and we have to care for it and value it the way we value life itself. Member for Boundary Smilkameen. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Speaker, science as a way of knowing relies on adherence to a scientific method. In short, look, be skeptical about everything, think, challenge your belief in a way that others can copy, prove yourself wrong because you can't be ever proven right in science, rinse and repeat. It is this process that is the magic of science. This process is what fuels the addiction to curiosity and to wonder of many scientists. I started my professional life trying to illuminate things through science, trying to clarify apolitical information that was important for society. I realized quickly that information wasn't society's rate limiting step. We knew enough about emissions, for example, and the negative impact on our economies, social cohesion, ecological health, and yet we still weren't seeing policy created in step with the evident risks. The real bottleneck was the people in policy making chambers like this across the globe not being able to effectively leverage the insights of the scientific community on behalf of the people they represent. Wendy Zhu of the Canadian Science Policy Centre shared a thought with me yesterday building upon this idea saying, quote, it is important for the future of our society to strengthen the connections between science and policy making. But science won't tell us what to do in this place. Our role here is to take the values we champion and overlay them onto the science, onto the boundaries of uncertainty that science identifies, and onto science's expectations of the outcomes of those decisions. Quote from the IRPP report in 2016, the input of science into policy should therefore be viewed not as advice on what should be done, but rather in terms of what is known, what is unknown, and, what, and how sure we are about it. Whether it's crafting risk reduction policy to navigate the onslaught of climate-related disasters, defining legislation to optimize the benefits of AI, or painting a clear picture of the danger of Meta's algorithm on the health of our children, science has a great deal to offer us as policymakers. It cannot offer solutions, but it does offer help. We just need to be ready to receive it. In two weeks, we will have about two dozen scientists visiting these halls through the Science Meets Parliament BC program to help. And I hope we all look forward to building those bridges together. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, again, a, another gentle reminder. <laughs> when people are asking questions, answering the question, please be brief so everybody has equal opportunity and uh, so both sides have the same time in the question period. So, Madam Clerk. Oral questions by members. Member for City South. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. The NDP's decriminalization policy of illicit drug use in hospitals is having devastating impacts on patients and healthcare staff. Yesterday, the BC Nurses Union confirmed that the contents of the Health Authority memo reflect the reality of rampant illicit drug use that's being allowed within hospitals and is compromising safety and care. Nurses face a daily reality of drug-fueled violence, from having drug smoke purposely blown in their faces, to being kicked, punched, shoved, and even stabbed while bathrooms are being lit on fire. Mr. Speaker, why is the Premier refusing to prioritize the safety of nurses 
and patients over the use of crystal meth, cocaine, and fentanyl in hospitals. Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. Um, the uh, uh, government, in all of our efforts in working with the Bursa PC Nurses Union, in working with the HEU, in working with the HSA, in working with communities, which prioritizes the safety of our healthcare workers above all things. We also recognize, Honorable Speaker, that many people who present in the hospitals are dealing with severe health issues, some mental health, some addictions, some physical health issues that require them to meet the very high standard of being admitted into our hospital. There are clear policies, as there are in Northern Health, with respect to these matters. Uh, and those clear policies are laid out uh, in all facilities in Northern Health and in all the other health authorities, Honorable Speaker. Possession and use of controlled substances are prohibited for all clients in emergency departments, any unit where clients under the age of 18 are present, inpatient psychiatric units and inpatient withdrawal units. This is just a fact, Honorable Speaker. The, the, it is absolutely prohibited to have weapons in hospitals. Now, does it occur, just as it occurs in the community, that events take part in, in place in the hospital that are contrary to those rules? They do occur. I meet with nurses all the time on these questions. And that's why we have taken unprecedented action, not because of the BC Nurses Union, because of nurses, but with them to improve access to security for all reasons in our hospital because of the priority we give to protecting those who do the extraordinary task of helping people get well in acute care settings. Member Supplemental. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. The leaked memo couldn't have been more clear that this government is not prioritizing the safety of health care workers. Illicit drug use is rampant in our hospitals and it's a direct and disturbing result of this NDP government's decriminalization policies outlined in a health authority memo. Under this NDP government, families face the dangers of meth, cocaine, and fentanyl use in spaces as routine as the local Tim Hortons and as critical as the emergency department. Shockingly, nurses say one of the most affected areas are maternity wards where infants are exposed to toxic substances. So why? Why is it the Premier putting the rights of patients and nurses and newborn babies to be safe in a hospital over the rights of open drug use of meth, crack cocaine, and fentanyl? Minister. Honourable Speaker, the member talks about smoking substances in hospitals. They are prohibited, period. Does it mean that that never happens? Of course it doesn't mean that never happens, Honourable Speaker. Of course it doesn't mean it never happens. But it is absolutely not allowed to do that. And this is not anything that's changed recently. It was true 10 years ago, it was true 20 years ago, and it's true now. Member for Prince George Wilmot. Well, thank you very much. And, uh Nurses were listening to the minister's answers yesterday, and they were outraged by his response. To suggest that a memo from the health authority was simply poorly worded, and to dismiss the reality that nurses face every single day is nothing but shameful. It has gotten so bad that Victoria General Hospital has been forced to install safety alarms in the maternity ward to detect toxic fentanyl smoke in the maternity ward. Imagine being a nurse in the maternity ward where a blinking light means you now scramble for a respirator to deal with toxic fumes. That's the reality for nurses at Victoria General. Why is the Premier prioritizing a policy that facilitates, there's no other way to describe it, facilitates drug use, drug trafficking, possession of weapons over the rights of nurses and newborn babies to be safe from exposure to heroin, meth, crack cocaine, and fentanyl. Minister of Health. Well, oh, Honourable Speaker, it, it's very straightforward. The policy is very straightforward. It's not allowed, period. 
one of the speakers. Members, 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 wait. Please cut. Let the minister finish it. Minister? Our, honorable Speaker, the policy of Northern Health and all the other health authorities are clear on these points, and they've been clear for decades. You don't smoke anything in a hospital, Honorable Speaker. That doesn't mean, Honorable Speaker, that those issues don't occur, and that is why, Honorable Speaker, we've taken such significant steps working with nurses who I've met with regularly on this very issue, Honorable Speaker. Uh, that we, uh, well, you know, the member, continuing member, narrative. Member, please. You know, they ask a question that's an extremely serious question for nurses, the ones I talk to. And, uh, Honorable Speaker, they can listen uh, to the answer. The answer is straightforward. It is absolutely not allowed, Honorable Speaker. We have added significantly 320 uh, security officers to come in place to support our, our public health care workers at the behest and with the involvement of the HEU, of the BCNU, of the HSA. And we're going to continue to take those steps to see that people are protected, Honorable Speaker. It has not been allowed, it's never been allowed that you can smoke in a hospital, at least not in recent times, not since we changed views significantly on smoking some decades ago. It's not been allowed at all, Honorable Speaker. It's not allowed now. And Northern Health has explicit policies, explicit policies that say it's prohibited and, the, and that, the, that members, hospitals are members. So the members may say that's not the case. They have explicit policies that says it is, and I encourage them to read them. Prince George Wilmot, supplemental. Well, you know, when the minister stands up every day and touts the fact there are security guards in hospitals, it is absolutely appalling that we are in a state where we actually have to have security guards in hospitals so people can go to work and be safe. It's not just Victoria. It is not just Northern Health. Members. It is across the province. Robert LaBelle, a nurse of over 20 years at Shuswap Lake Hospital, wrote to the Premier a month ago. He describes walking into a bathroom to aid a patient, and I quote, I was met with thick, acrid smoke and inhaled what turned out to be fentanyl, end quote. He explains how this danger could easily happen to an unsuspecting grandmother visiting the hospital and highlights that illicit drug use is not only repeatedly found in hospital rooms, it is facilitated. That is from nurse Robert LaBelle. How dare the minister callously dismiss concerns like of the nurses like Robert that they are expressing every single day in British Columbia by trying to suggest that a health authority memo was simply poorly worded. Minister. Well, thank you, Honorable Speaker. And the opposition now is opposed to the bringing in service of security guards, of improving their treatment, of improving security. Members, mem member for Surrey no. South. Members, members will come to order. Minister. We've had security guards, Honorable Speaker, in hospital for some time. What the BC Nurses Union and what the Hospital Employees Union and the Health Sciences Association asked for was an upgrading of that, was a deprivatization of those services, so something that the previous government, of course, pursued as a matter of policy. And we have made those changes and added 320 security guards, relational security officers, more, very significantly trained in 26 acute care hospitals, and we plan to, to expand that. It's not the answer to every problem, but it was specifically requested by the very nurses the members talking about. So to be derisive about it, Honorable Speaker, to be members, derisive about it is not... Member on, for Surrey South, please come to order. To be derisive about it is not the right approach, Honorable Speaker. It, what, what occurred, um, what occurs, if people are smoking in hospitals. Members, please, please continue and conclude. Stop it. Please. No. Minister will conclude. Thank you. Uh, it's absolutely not allowed. 
clearly stated in health authority policies to smoke anywhere in a hospital, Honorable Speaker. And Honorable Speaker, we are taking the steps to support our health care workers, to support the very nurses members of the opposition talked about, and we're doing it by working with them, Honorable Speaker. We supported and funded, Honorable Speaker, Switch BC, which is an organization that's designed to improve those things and was heavily involved in the relation security model. The Switch BC needed to be created because the, the, the agency supporting the occupational health care, health and safety of health care workers was eliminated Thank by the you. previous government. Member for Prince George Wilmer's second supplemental. This chamber and try to twist my words all he wants, but let's be clear. I'm going to hold him accountable for the safety of nurses in British Columbia every single day. And if the minister wants to talk about clear policy, how about a memo, Premier Minister? Let, here's what it says. Under direction from risk management and professional practice. It is a memo. Let me remind the minister how clearly the information is articulated. Item four, patients can use substances while in a hospital in their rooms. They, either, they can either be provided with a Narcan kit or have one available. Item number six, we don't restrict if they're dropping off substances. Item, an item at the bottom of the list, ensure that patients know they do not need to hide their substances and can keep them in their belongings. How clear is that? So the minister can cry to absolutely point the finger somewhere else. This is on his shoulders. It is happening in hospitals every single day. And it sounds an awful lot like illicit drug use and drug trafficking to me and to nurses and to British Columbians. So here's the challenge. The will the minister today issue a directive a directive to every single health authority that illicit drug use is not permitted, weapons are not allowed, and the safety of nurses and patients will be prioritized over the open use of meth, crack cocaine, and fentanyl. Minister of Health. Uh, Honourable Speaker, uh, uh, the Honourable Member asks a serious question starts heckling before I even speak. You know, Honourable Speaker, uh, uh, I take these issues very seriously because I meet with nurses and healthcare workers and we work together, we work together on these issues. Weapons are Members. never, are not allowed, cannot be allowed, will not be allowed in hospitals, period, Honourable Speaker, period. And that is health authority policy. It is clarified. There's a health authority policy, I'll, I'll happily share it with the Honourable Member. It is clear, Honourable Speaker. Ma 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 Members. Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. It, it is, Honourable Speaker, absolutely not allowed. Honourable Speaker, we do not, and we work with our health care workers, because there are, Honourable Speaker, as the members know, as a growing number, well, Honourable Speaker, uh, you know, I take this issue unbelievably seriously. We work with nurses and health sciences professionals and health care workers every day on these issues. Because when, Honourable Speaker, when people are, enter our hospital, enter our hospitals, they enter often with very significant health care conditions. And it's our job, for example, at St. Paul's Hospital, it's absolutely true that there's harm reduction on site at St. Paul's Hospital because of the very specific conditions of that hospital, Honourable Speaker. Thank you. We, Honourable Speaker, we, Honourable Speaker, uh, support nurses, support health care workers every day. And, uh, Honourable Speaker, you know, Honourable Speaker, this is, this is an attempt to ignore the policies that health authorities have. They're clear and straightforward. I don't need to issue any... M members, members, members. Question was very clear. Now let's uh, hear the uh, answer. 
let's, let's please, we don't have to repeat the question. Member, Minister, When, pe when conclude, people come please. to the hospital, we do everything we can to help them get better and to keep people safe. And that will continue to be our policy every day. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Thousands of British Columbians face impossible choices buy groceries or heat the house, keep up with bills, or pay rent on time. Politicians are ignoring the real causes of the cost of living crisis and scapegoating putting a price on carbon pollution. One thing driving inflation is price gouging by oil and gas companies. Shell, one of the main proponents behind LNG Canada and a beneficiary of subsidies and tax credits in this province, made $28 billion in profits last year. We can't allow CEOs and shareholders to get richer and richer from climate destruction while average British Columbians pay the price. According to recent polling, 62% of Canadians say Canada should introduce a tax on the oil and gas sector's record profits. A windfall profit tax could help alleviate the high cost of living in BC. My question is to the Premier. Will his government stop giving a free ride to harmful industries and push the federal government to implement a windfall profits tax? Minister of Energy and Mines. Thank you very much, Speaker, and, and thank you very much to the member opposite for the question. Uh, let me address the issue of fossil fuel subsidies that she raises, and I think the member understands that it's been <coughs> something that our government's been very focused on for, for far too long. We've had a broken system, and this government has uh, taken extensive work to fixing a very outdated oil and gas royalty system and in fact eliminating the largest subsidy on record, the, uh, the largest one, the Deepwell Royalty Program. Mr. Speaker, going forward, we've taken strong action on industry like the LNG industry through our new energy action framework, putting an oil and gap, uh, gas emissions cap in place, ensuring that all new permitted facilities are net zero by 2030. We consider uh, that to be the way forward that balances the interests of all British Columbians knowing we need to take strong action on climate, that we need to hold companies accountable for the emissions that they emit, and that we continue to ensure that all British Columbians can take strong action on climate. Thank you. Leader of Third Party Supplemental. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I'd really love it if the government would take strong answer, action on answering the question I actually asked, so I'll try again. Shell took home $28 billion in profits last year. The question I'm asking the Premier is, will he push the federal government to put a windfall profits tax in place so that these companies that are causing climate disasters and costing British Columbians enormous amounts of money will pay their fair share? So my question again through you is to the Premier. Will he push the federal government to put a windfall profit tax in place? Minister of, uh, sorry, Government House Leader. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Um, I think the member knows that um, most of our members on this side of the House uh, care deeply about inequality in our society. And when we see most. large, <laughs> most members of this House, um, I can't speak for the opposition, um, but, Honourable Speaker, what I can say to the member is this. Um, the federal government uh, has you know, policies and, and reforms that they're looking at. What we can talk to the member about is what we're doing here in British Columbia. And what we're doing here in British Columbia is we're making sure that those that are the wealthiest in our province pay a little bit more so that we can ensure that everyone that is struggling in our communities has a little bit more support. That is the inequality that we fight for every day. Inequality in health care, inequality in housing, inequality in society overall, Mr. Speaker. We're committed to that work. We've been doing that since 2017, and we're going to continue to do that work in years forward. House Leader of the Fourth Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Under the decriminalization and safe supply policies of this NDP government, Open drug dens like Vancouver's notorious downtown East Hastings are popping up in small towns and communities across BC. What used to be big city problems are ravaging small communities in British Columbia as addicts are bussed from Vancouver and Victoria into communities all across BC. As it turns out, when government takes away tax money from working families who are literally living paycheck to paycheck and uses it to buy addictive drugs for addicts, 
we end up with more drug users, more crime, more chaos, and fewer safe streets for people and families. Who would have seen this coming, Mr. Speaker, other than anyone with an ounce of common sense? Mr. Speaker, in the beautiful community of Courtney, in the Comox Valley, Cliff Avenue and 6 is the intersection where open drug use, chaos and crime spills out into businesses and residential streets. My question, Mr. Speaker, to the NDP Premier, will you apologize to the residents of Courtney and the Comox Valley for the NDP pro-drug use policies which have brought big city addiction, chaos and crime into their small safe community? Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. And, uh, and, and given this member's history of how he treats the most vulnerable people in his community, I'm not surprised by the question I heard today. Uh, this continuously dehumanizing the most vulnerable people in our society is not a new trait. Uh, it's, it's actually on brand for this new BC Conservative Party. Honourable Speaker, the suggestion that people are being loaded up on buses and moved to communities is one we've been hearing for a long time, but the data does not support it. The data shows that overwhelmingly, the, po the populations that are struggling in communities are people within our communities, they're our loved ones, they're the people that we grew up with, we went to school with, uh, they're, they're many cases our kids. And so, Honorable Speaker, the member talks about Courtney Comox. We have been doing a lot of work in that community, the MLA for Courtney Comox and I, working with mayor and council to address challenges in that community. There's a lack of housing. Uh, available. There's right now a, um, a welcome center, a, a, a shelter right now that wasn't purpose built, that wasn't ideal for the community. That's why last week we announced we're purchasing a brand new parcel of land, we're building a purpose built rental, uh, purpose built shelter, uh, building affordable housing so that we can get people the supports they need. Get them housed, get them the supports they need, all speaker. That's how you get things done. Not rhetoric, dehumanizing people, but working with communities to find solutions, and that's what we've been doing every single day. House Leader Fourth Party Supplemental. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It'd be nice if once this minister stood up and talked about detox and actually getting people to sobriety. Mr. Speaker, yesterday we learned that this Premier's pro-drug use policies are also harming health care workers who, have already, who are already overworked and overwhelmed, facing the worst staffing crisis our province's health care system has ever seen. Mr. Speaker, we learned that this NDP Premier is forcing health care workers to simply accept illicit drug use in hospitals including fumes from smoking drugs, which already made one nurse sick. So to be clear, if you smoke crack in an ER in BC, that's fine, but if you're behind on your jabs, you can't work as a nurse, you get fired. Mr. Speaker, the problem with this NDP government is that no one in the Premier's office has any common sense. So my question, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, does he honestly think being cared for by a BC nurse who hasn't taken the jab is less safe for patients and infants than inhaling crack fumes? Minister of Health. Oh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. And of course, uh, Honourable Speaker, it, it isn't allowed, it wouldn't be allowed. What the Honourable Member said isn't true. And uh, I don't expect a higher standard, uh, Honourable Speaker. So Member. Minister will continue. Uh, Honourable Speaker, and, and I think uh, on all of these questions, from uh, the overdose public health and emergency uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic, that the member also, um, for reasons uh, of his own, has raised here, we take strong evidence-based health care policies that focus on helping people. And we're going to continue to do that, Honourable Speaker, is that is what our public health care system absolutely should do. We need to treat people with addiction problems, Honourable Speaker, and addiction issues uh, with health care responses. And that's what the, the public health care system is doing throughout. And I think, uh, Honourable Speaker, to suggest otherwise, is simply incorrect to Thank suggest you. that it would ever be allowed 
that someone could smoke in a hospital away is incorrect, and the member knows it. Member for Coquitlam, Millardwell. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, imagine that you're a young adult on a university campus, perhaps living on your own for the very first time. You're excited and mostly nervous. But early in the semester, you find yourself isolated and afraid on your campus as hundreds of your fellow students don kafiyas and face coverings chanting intifada. They wear the uniform and shout the mantra exhibited by Hamas terrorists who slaughtered, raped, and kidnapped people your own age at an Israeli music festival on October 7th. Imagine, imagine what that must feel like. On February 28th, the Premier was asked about a potential referendum being proposed to the UBC AMS leadership. More than 1,200 UBC students signed the petition asking the AMS to cut all ties with Israel, including canceling the lease for Halal House, a safe haven for Jewish students on campus, one that has existed for over 75 years. Jewish students have felt intimidated and afraid on BC campuses for months, and Hillel House is a safe space for them in this very difficult time. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to roll my two questions into one, given the time constraint. My first question was initially for the new Minister of Post-Secondary Education, who shared with me her belief, and I quote, government does stand up to anti-Semitism, absolutely, end quote. I checked, Mr. Speaker, to see if the, minister, the new minister had reached out to Hillel House to check on Jewish students, to hear their concerns, to identify ways government can ensure their physical, emotional, and spiritual safety on campus. And I'm going to answer the question for her, Mr. Speaker, because I heard this morning, again, that, um, that in fact the minister has not reached out at all from the minister uh, for, to Hillel House two months into her role. When the Premier was asked for his comments on the AMS proposed referendum, this is what the Premier had to say, and I quote, a small group of students, I understand, is requesting that the AMS sanction a referendum about whether or not Hillel House at UBC should be allowed to continue to exist, end quote. He did, however, go on to say that there is a, a couple of ways to look at this. First is, obviously, it's illegal on its face. The BC Human Rights Code implicates the AMS just like it implicates all organizations, end quote. So, Mr. Speaker, the Premier's first comment is to minimize the impact by describing more than 1,200 signatures as a small group of students. Then he suggests that because it's illegal, the Jewish students should take comfort because they can just sue the AMS. The Premier refused to show leadership and instead passed the responsibility to the AMS when he said, and I quote, there's an opportunity for leadership among the AMS leadership. Mr. Speaker, members of the Jewish community on campuses in K-12 education, and the BC Public Service do not feel safe. And the Premier's lack of direction Question or action member. exacerbates anti-Semitism in our province. This is why members of the Jewish community have been calling on the Premier to create a plan to address increasing and rising anti-Semitism in his government and in the wider society. So my question is to the Premier or anyone on the front bench who would like to answer this question. There's an opportunity for leadership for this government. When will the Premier and his government show leadership and share their plan to address anti-Semitism in our schools, in post-secondary education institutions, and in the BC Public Service? Government House Leader. Uh, thank you so much, Honourable Speaker. Um, thank the member for the question. And uh, I think it's, first off, it's important to say that, you know, we acknowledge the, the pain and fear felt by many uh, within the Jewish community since October 7th. Uh, we've been hearing uh, from members from the Jewish community. I have been meeting with members of the Jewish community from my community uh, and, and sharing with them and hearing from them about uh, where we can go from this uh, place that we're in now. Uh, now, I, I know that um, uh, we have taken a lot of steps and I think it's important to acknowledge that um, Perhaps the member uh, feels that we haven't done enough, but we're committed to continue to do more on this, Honourable Speaker. I think it's important for the public to know that since October 7th, the Premier made a statement in this House calling out anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. On October 30th, since then, Holocaust education was launched in all schools across British Columbia. November 15th, we provided security uh, funding for religious community and organizations. We launched a racist uh, incident helpline. Uh, February 16th, we updated the BC Prosecution Service, Honourable Speaker, and we continue to work with uh, the community to ensure ways. Now, the Premier did uh, say uh, in this House that um, we were hoping the AMS would show leadership, and then they did. Overwhelmingly, Honourable Speaker, they voted uh, against that petition that was brought forward. It's a reminder that 
Our communities are strong. Uh, we want, everyone wants to make sure that we continue to create safe and exclusive spaces. The Minister of Advanced Education uh, has been meeting with every single university, meeting with uh, the uh, leadership on ensuring that they're putting in plans to make sure that everyone feels safe in their community. The member knows that this is a, a challenging file. There's a lot happening uh, on this file. Um, but making sure our kids are safe in school. This is not a honorable speaker. This members, is, this is not a topic for heckling from the opposition. Members, please. I think this is a topic that is so important that we all should be. Please conclude. Thank you, honorable speaker. Uh, a member says that we. This is what leadership is. It's all the work we've been doing, bringing back anti-racism strategy, bringing a human rights commission, honorable speaker. There's, we are committed to this work, honorable speaker. This is important. And, and since day one, since forming government, we have made a priority to make sure that everyone feels safe in British Columbia. Yes, we have more work to do. We're Thank going to continue to do that important work. Members, the chair is willing to allow one more question. At as long as it's very brief, 30 seconds, and also provided that there is no interjection when the answer is provided, so we are not going way over limit. Member Farah, sorry, White Rock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gas prices are expected to skyrocket up to $2.18 a litre. The NDP have caused the highest gas prices and gas taxes in Canada, but instead of get cutting taxes, the NDP have, NDP have blamed gouging. They set up an expensive website to duplicate gasbuddy.com and then they did nothing. People don't want taxpayer funded websites, they want relief at the pump. When will the Premier learn, listen to British Columbians and cut the gas tax when it comes to gasoline? Minister of Environment. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. We know that British Columbians are struggling with affordability. We know that part of that affordability, as well as part of their concern for their kids' future, is about climate change. That's why we have a strong climate, climate plan, and that's why we take actions like putting $500 back in people's pockets through the Enhanced BC Family Benefit Bonus this year, along with a range of other measures that support affordability by keeping fees and rates low and stable, unlike the government that sat on this side of the House before us. The balance question period. Thank you. Yep. No, that's fine. Um, opposition House Leader. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I seek uh, leave to move Motion 25, which is on the order paper in my name, and which says, uh, be it resolved that pursuant to Section 13, Subsection 2 of the Auditor General Act, the Legislative Assembly request the Auditor General undertake an examination of the Government of British Columbia's Clean BC Go Electric program, including but not limited to the Commercial Vehicle Innovation Challenge and the Advanced Research and Commercialization Program administered by MNP LLP with a view to examining any potential conflict of interest relating to program administrators charging success fees to successful applicants who use their advisory services. Is leave granted? Aye. Thank you. Member for Camus North Thompson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we canvassed this as, as a question at the end of question period on Tuesday, but uh, last night in, at uh, the Public Accounts Committee, uh, we did try a similar motion. And, member, and I'm just advised that uh, the member for um, Camus South Thompson has to uh, move the motion oh. to start first. Leave has been granted. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, uh, I assumed that reading the actual uh, motion was, uh, was sufficient, but... Uh, just move it. Just move it, okay, yeah. So I, I move uh, motion 25, which is on the order paper in my name. Member for Campbell's North Thompson, now can speak. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's, it's a very uh, straightforward uh, motion, and, and really we tried doing this at public accounts last night. Unfortunately, the government uh, uh, does have the majority on that committee, and they, they were not willing uh, to try to instruct the Auditor General, although it is within the, the mandate of public accounts to do just that. 
Um, really, this is about getting to the bottom of a matter that's been raised that uh, has very serious potential ramifications uh, if it bears out uh, to be accurate. Uh, uh, the opposition has, has strong evidence that uh, there is something to look into there and uh, that best place for that would be the Auditor General who has the ability uh, to dig into this on, as an issue uh, of importance to make sure that there is not uh, any type of a kickback scheme or corruption or, or anything untoward going on uh, within programs uh, that are being funded by the province of British Columbia and adjudicated uh, by outside parties. And that is simply the basis of this, is to try to uh, get some uh, daylight onto what is actually happening uh, so that people can have confidence in a program that is fully funded uh, by carbon taxes. At a time there's a lot of carbon tax debate going on in the public, um, it's pretty hard to keep having, uh, building public support for a tax if people aren't very confident about how those funds are being expended with any proper oversight or not. So that is the, the crux of the motion and we do hope that the, the Chamber will support it. Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. The member uh, already answered the question that he's asking, which the Auditor General has the ability to look into these matters uh, if they choose to, so we will not be supporting this motion. Leader of the Third Party. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to this. I, I think that it is, I support the motion, I think that it is really important that British Columbians can look at processes by which Funds are being granted under any program in, the, in BC, particularly in, in, uh, when it comes to government programming, and that they can look at it and be assured that there is absolute transparency and absolute clarity about how these programs are being administered, who's adjudicating the decisions, and what the processes are for the adjudicators and how it is in this case that it appears to be that the adjudicator is also a body that can receive a fee, a success fee, for successful applicants for grant programs under this program. I think that it is really important for the government to come uh, out in a, in a very transparent way with the public and be able to demonstrate that this program is being appropriately handled, that it is being handled in a way that does not create any distrust or lack of trust for those who are applying for the program, for those who are going through the process of applying for these grants, that they can be assured that the granting process is transparent, accountable, fair, and administered in a way that all British Columbians would look to it and say, I understand that, I can see how this is being done, I can see that it's accountable and fair. And in this case, I think there are a lot of questions that have been, uh, that are coming up, and I don't think that there was a particularly clear answer given the other day when this was raised. And I think that it, it is an appropriate, appropriate question to be asking given the importance it is to maintain public trust. Leader of the Fourth Party. Thank you uh, very much, and uh, I support this motion as well um, going forward. The Conservative Party of British Columbia has received evidence uh, from numerous companies about this program, one company in particular who was told uh, by MNP to add 20% onto the contract being put forward so that they could be paying a fee to MNP who then would adjudicate the program for making decisions. This clearly there is a serious problem with this program. It needs to be looked into. It should be taken seriously by this government. Yes, the Auditor General has the ability to look into it themselves, but clearly government should be very concerned about how taxpayers, are being, taxpayers' money is being spent on this, particularly from the carbon tax. This does need to be looked into, and I encourage government to reconsider its position and instruct the uh, Auditor General to look into this so that it can clear up this matter and make it sure that there isn't anything that is going on that government should perhaps be ashamed of going into the election. Member for Skina. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. And if, if, this, if this issue is voted down by a majority of the votes, then it becomes a partisan issue. 
This shouldn't be a partisan issue. This actually, this is what this institution is supposed to stand for. We're, we're supposed to be open, transparent, and accountable with taxpayers' dollars and the policies, legislation, and regulations that flows from taxpayers' dollars. There's hints that there's corruption here coming from a party that's been appointed by government to distribute dollars for a clean, act, clean energy plan, for a BC company that fairly wants to be subsidized by BC tax dollars. And they're accusing a party of not playing fair. 87 MLAs in this institution swore to uphold what this institution is supposed to stand for. We are not doing our job as MLAs if we allow this issue to be swept under the rug. This has already been brought to public accounts and has been voted down. The House leader has already said they will not support this, meaning the majority NDP government will vote this down so we don't even get to uncover what's really happening at the lower levels of this. The opposition is trying to do our job. We're trying to hold the government accountable. But more importantly, we're trying to uphold what this institution is supposed to be here for. We're supposed to uphold 87 riding's interest and the interest of British Columbians and as a province. The reputation of the BC legislature is at stake here as well. It's not just government. What are we doing here if we're not actually doing what the people elect us to do? It's going to be a shame if this issue is swept under the rug and this is voted down by a majority government simply for politics. House Leader of the Third Party. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I'm just going to stand and ask that the government reconsider, uh, uh, retract whatever statements need to be retracted and just vote in favor of this motion. Um, the, the reality of it is, is that there is uh, pretty overwhelming evidence that, uh, that there's something that needs to be looked at. Let's look at it. Uh, if the government is so certain that it's not, uh, that it isn't what it is, uh, then, you know, this will all pass. And, you know, I think to have, uh, to have members from government talking about this being political theater, this is the work of government. They remember when they were in opposition. This is exactly the work that they did when they were in opposition. This is exactly the work of opposition is to critique government programs and to ensure that they're being delivered fairly, to ensure that there aren't corporations and business and other entities that are, that are uh, unfairly benefiting from government programs, uh, unreasonably benefiting from government programs, being in the position to not only uh, take in uh, the, the applications, uh, but also adjudicate the applications and then, and then reaching out and saying, hey, we'll prepare the applications for you at a fee. That seems to be uh, smoke, Mr. Speaker, and you know what they say about where there's smoke, there's fire, and I think that there is an opportunity here for government to reverse the decision that they made, to open this up, to have a look at it, and to prove to us that the smoke is just smoke and that maybe there is no fire. Thank you. Seeing no further, uh, sorry, uh, House Leader of the Fourth Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, will, I too would also encourage the government to rethink its position on this. We do have a duty to ensure that taxpayer dollars are being appropriately spent. And if this government chooses to not have the Auditor General look into this particular case, what it says to the voters is that they have something to hide. They have something to hide. Because a third party is inappropriately, allegedly, taking advantage of a system does not necessarily mean that government is complicit. So a wise government that does have nothing to hide would open it up and allow the Auditor General to do the job that should be demanded by the public. Failure to direct him to do that. Failure, failure, to, failure to have this investigated by an independent party, I think is a travesty of the system that we have actually put in place. Direct. 
an independent body. So it becomes very partisan. The taxpayers want to know that their money is being spent appropriately. It's as simple as that. There should be nothing to hide, Mr. Speaker. Opposition House Leader. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think uh, I think we've uh, we've heard some very uh, good points uh, as a number of members across the entire opposition parties have expressed uh, or have, have intervened and, and expressed, uh, uh, I think, some very valid uh, reasons as to why uh, the government has a, a choice that they that they need to make here. Members, members, please. Let's hear one member at a time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The reality is this. Uh, over a, a number of months now, uh, the official opposition caucus has been in receipt of phone calls, uh, uh, emails. We have had meetings, face-to-face -face meetings, with uh, uh, individuals, with uh, uh, companies uh, that have been actively engaged in uh, the, the, uh, the grant program in question. Uh, that have come forward and expressed some very, uh, have made some very serious accusations and expressed some very uh, significant reservations uh, about uh, the nature of this program in terms of its adjudication and related success fees that are provided to the adjudicator, MNPLLP. Now, the opposition is not saying that um, uh, that uh, um, uh, these are anything more than allegations. But what we are saying is this is exactly what the role of the Auditor General uh, should be all about, and it is all about. And there is an opportunity here for the government to do the right thing, pursuant to this standing order, uh, to pursuant to, sorry, to Section 13, Subsection 2 of the Auditor General Act, to direct the Auditor General to uh, conduct an audit looking into this matter. Now, this is not a, 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 a gotcha moment from the opposition. We asked questions of the Minister of Energy and Mines earlier this week about this exact matter. She, uh, the minister uh, skated right past it, didn't acknowledge it at all, Talked, uh, gave an answer to a totally different topic. We then had, uh, a, uh, we, uh, as part of our role in the official opposition of the Public Accounts Committee uh, last evening, the member from Fraser Nicola, the member from Kamloops uh, North Thompson, uh, brought forward a, a motion specifically brought forward by the member from Fraser Nicola, very similar to this one here today, to the members on the Public Accounts Committee, which also have the statutory ability to direct the Auditor General to look into this matter. And the NDP members, the government members, the government majority on that committee said no. So the only other opportunity, the last chance or final uh, effort to uh, provide an opportunity for the government to do the right thing here is pursuant to the motion that I have brought forward uh, today. This would require M uh, the, the Auditor General to look into this matter. Requiring 20% success fees on grants success fees uh, to the, the, the company that's actually doing the adjudication, if true, is wrong on so many levels. And that practice, uh, if it is happening, needs to stop. The only way that British Columbians will know is if there's actually uh, a, an audit and investigation into this. And that's the role of the Auditor General. So today, the government members uh, have the opportunity uh, to, uh, to do the right thing. And I would point out one, one final piece uh, uh, so as not to, to forget to enter this into the record. Um, individuals that we have met with who have expressed concerns, some of the individuals, actually met with members of staff of the Minister of Mines and Energy's uh, office about a month ago and expressed exactly these concerned, concerns. Walked the minister's staff through what they were being told they needed to do to have a higher degree of, of possibility of success in receiving the grants from this program, meaning pay up the 20% uh, 
uh, agree to the 20% uh, success fee or you're likely not going to have an opportunity uh, to receive the grant. That was brought forward to the Minister of Energy and Mines staff. That is a fact. So this is not, um, uh, this is not um, uh, in, in any way scurrilous, this isn't in any way rumors. These are actual companies, actual people that have been trying to do the right thing. They have tried to reach out to the minister. They've met with the minister's staff. They've expressed these concerns. And uh, they were essentially, uh, you know, patted on the head and, you know, thank you for coming forward. And nothing has changed. And then we have had subsequent uh, examples brought forward to us from other individuals. So, uh, in summary, I would hope that the, the government, in hearing, um, you know, frankly, interventions from all opposition parties, uh, would uh, 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 hope that the government would actually change its mind here um, and depart from the position that the government house leader entered into the record uh, uh, moments ago and actually agree to sh uh, 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 this, this motion to direct the Auditor General to look into this, to get the answers, to dig into it, to make sure that if there is anything uh, inappropriate happening, if there is anything corrupt happening, if there is anything uh, that, uh, uh, that is actually um, impugning the ability of, of, of private individuals and companies from accessing grants due to success fee requirements and so forth, that that information is brought to the light of day, that the windows are, are thrown open, that air is allowed in, and that, uh, that changes be made as required. So again, we urge the government to support this motion, to support the transparency, the accountability, and the fairness uh, that, uh, that must exist in all grant programs, but particularly in the, in the grant programs that are at the, at the center of what we believe is, uh, is, is the, the, the potentially some, some significant corruption. And it certainly stinks to high heaven, and the British Columbians deserve to know what uh, is actually going on here. <clears throat> Thank you. Minister, Minister of Energy and Mines. Thank Sorry. you very much, Honourable Speaker. You don't want to hear? Sorry, Minister. Um, the member has already uh, concluded uh, the debate because I didn't recognize uh, you earlier. The motion is moved by the opposition house leader, which was on uh, votes and proceedings, not on order of papers, so everybody clear. So all those in favor indicate aye. Aye. Those who oppose indicate nay. Nay. Division has been called.
member, member for Cookerton Bark Mountain.
Members, you have heard the motion. All those in favor of the motion, please rise or indicate. Please be seated. Those who oppose, please rise or indicate. Thank you, be seated. And the clerk will be contacting members online. Minister Baer. I vote nay. Ms. Chen. I vote nay. Mr. Klovchuk. I vote yay. Mr. Davies. I vote aye. Thank you. Ms. Dykeman. I vote nay. Ms. Padden. I vote nay. Ms. Rice? I vote nay. Ms. Sims? I vote nay. Those voting aye, Dirksen, Millibar, Stone, Bond, Halford, Ross, Oaks, Bernier, Payton, Davies, Kylo, Shapitka, Sturko, Merrifield, Watt, Lee, Stewart, Klovchuk, Ashton, Sturdy, Letnick, Tagart, Firstenau, Olson, Rustad, Banman, and Walker, 27. Those voting nay, Chandra Herbert, Singh, Babchuk, Coulter, Lore, Bear, Kang, Heyman, Osborne, Cullen, Baines, Malcolmson, Bailey, Mercier, Brar, Russ, Russell, Rutledge, Starchuk, Rice, Yao, Leonard, R. Singh, Whiteside, Farnworth, Callon, Conroy, Sharma, Dix, Fleming, Dean, Rankin, Alexis, Sims, Elmore, Glumack, Routley, Deeth, Donnelly, Green, Anderson, Chant, Sandu, Dykeman, Padden, Bag, and Chen, 46. Motion failed. I thank you, Mr. I want to rise on a point of order. Um, the member for Columbia River Soak actually voted nay. No, no, that, that member did not vote nay. He voted yay, which should, should have been I. So, table heard. Good, good try. Good, good try, though. Thank you, member. It's okay. <laughs> Madam Clerk. Orders of the day. Uh, thank you. Speaker, Speaker of the Main call second reading on Bill 12, Public Health Accountability and Cost Recovery Act. Hey, committee chairs. Member for, are, are you?
recognizing the member for Surrey White Rock. Thank you and, uh, and welcome Madam Speaker. Uh, I'm going to uh, continue my remarks on, uh, on Bill 12 here uh, where I concluded. I um, believe some of the stuff I was referencing yesterday was just some of the overarching concerns and we're hearing uh, consistently from, from communities, specifically the business communities and their concerns for Bill 12. Um, I talked yesterday about the broadness. Uh, I talked about the broadness of the scope. I talked about the fact is when you specifically look at Clause 9, it grants a minister unprecedented power to issue certificates establishing the cost of the health care benefits. I think one of the challenges that we see is that the businesses, and well, British Columbians for that matter, are what they expect from government is, you know, they're not going to agree with every piece of legislation that comes in. We understand that, but what they, they do expect is some level of certainty when they, when they get there. And I think that's, that's one of the main issues. Uh, well, we know that's one of the issues from the correspondence that we are seeing coming into our offices. And I know ministers, cabinet, premier, uh, MLAs on all sides are seeing the exact same thing. Uh, and it's concerned specifically on the, on the scope of, of Bill 12. And so when we see issues, the fact is, is that, you know, they say, if enacted, the law appears to apply to any product, good services, or byproduct, which we understand can create any liability for almost any business operating in our connected to BC. That's transformational. And I think it's something that Probably only a fraction of businesses in BC know that this is now currently before the House getting debated. But the potential impacts, which even we as opposition can't educate them on because there's no proper definitions in this legislation. So if a constituent or a business that resides in my riding comes in and says, what will Bill 12 mean for me? And my business, even if this, if this legislation passes, I, I, based on what's contained in it, I won't have the answers. Whether I agree on it or not won't matter because I challenge anybody in this house to get up and, and, and define what this legislation actually encompasses and we know some of the, the powers that are given to cabinet in terms of, like I said before, as being the judge and the jury. But the question to government has got to be put is, is has proper consultation been done on this piece of legislation? And I think the overwhelming response from some major significant organizations are saying absolutely not. It hasn't. And they've got legitimate concerns. And I think British Columbians in general would have significant concerns. The intentions of this bill can be wonderful. But if they're not properly defined in a way that, that people understand what the consequences mean to them, to their employees, to their sector, that's a dangerous, dangerous precedent and level of control that we are giving. So with that, uh, Madam Chair, I know that there's other speakers that would like to speak after me, so I will, uh, I will take my seat and I thank the House for letting me uh, give my remarks. Thank you, Member. Recognizing the Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. It's indeed a privilege to stand any time in this House and represent my constituents. Um, I'm going to speak to Bill 12, but while I have the attention of the Minister of Health, uh, just in case um, something takes him away later, I just want to start with where I'm going to end with this, which is w what a different example of public consultation than what he and I and the leader of the third party did when we reviewed the Health Professions Act. When we reviewed the Health Professions Act, we actually went out to the public and asked them for their input on a series of recommendations. Once we got the input, we went out to the public again and said, well, here's where, where we're at. Here's what we're thinking about. And got, again, 
some input. And be, that's, at that point, after two extensive public consultations, asking people, stakeholders, that were actually going to get involved in the implementation of, of the changes, plus the general public, after two of those extensive over months, did the government put together its legislation and done its consultation in addition to that before it introduced Bill 36. Now granted, Bill 36 wasn't exactly the same as what we were recommending. There were some changes to that, and that's the prerogative of government. But the consultation was extensive. And now we have this, Bill 12, with no public consultation, no consultation with the stakeholders, at least none that they're saying they've had, unless they did and they had to sign non-disclosure agreements, but I'm not aware of that. You know, so, so I'm going to start with where I was going to end, because I had the attention of someone, a champion, I believe, of how things should, should be done and how things should not be done. And this is a perfect example of how it should not be done. So having said that, I will repeat that again, probably in about 27 minutes from now, in my uh, time allotted of my 30 minutes. So thank you, Honourable Speaker. Uh, I rise today to address Bill 12, the Public Health Accountability and Cost Recovery Act 2024. And um, you know, on the surface, it uh, promises to safeguard public health and ensure wrongdoers bear the cost of their actions. So I've read the legislation. I've uh, looked at the public comments made by members of the government. Uh, for example, the introduction of the bill was introduced by the Attorney General and she said uh, the bill is intended to hold wrongdoers accountable for their harmful conduct, including the promotion, marketing and distribution of harmful products. So on the surface it would appear to be pretty uh, clear, but then you uh, start going through the legislation and the legislation isn't, isn't that long. Some 13 pages. But uh, the key parts for me are actually at the front end of the legislation. And if you look on the page two of the legislation in uh, the section on definitions, and then page three of the, of the legislation, health-related wrongs, and clause two. Clause two actually identifies the purpose of the legislation, where it says the government has a direct and distinct action against a person to recover the cost of health care benefits caused or contributed to by a health-related wrong. So again, the government has a direct and distinct action against a person to recover the cost of health care benefits caused or contributed to by a health-related wrong. So what is a health-related wrong? Well, if you look at the definitions again in Clause 1, a health-related wrong means A, a breach by a person of a common law, equitable or statutory duty or obligation owed to persons of British Columbia. So again, it's a breach of a person's common law equitable or statutory duty or obligation, and B, a tort that is committed in British Columbia by a person that has caused or contributes to, and here it is, disease, injury, or illness. So the legislation is saying in one piece that if you have an action based on a health-related wrong, the next piece is that health-related wrong contributes to the disease, injury, and illness of a person then you're going to be in trouble. Well, what is a disease, injury, or illness? What disease, injury, or illnesses are they talking about in the legislation? And that, again, is defined in the first three pages. Disease, Ill, uh, injury, or illness includes the following, Mr. Speaker. A, physical or mental injury or illness. So not just physical, but also mental injury. B, problematic product use. Problematic. What's, how far is problematic? Who defines that? C, addiction. So I assume any addiction. D, general deterioration of health. 
E, the risk of disease, injury, or illness. So disease, injury, or illness is defined by the risk of, dis of disease, <laughs> injury, or illness, Mr. Speaker. There's no limit, again, what the legislation will cover. And that's, I think, in large part, why these people that are believe they will be impacted, these businesses and their representatives, are um, writing the letters to the government at this point, asking for a pause and asking for that consultation that should have happened prior to the legislation being introduced to happen now. Now, I have a lot more to say on this, specifically 23 minutes, but if you wouldn't mind, Mr. Speaker, I will reserve my right to say it later and adjourn debate. Member, you heard the question to adjourn the debate. All those in favor indicate aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Government House Leader. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. We'll see everyone at 1 o'clock. I move that the House do now adjourn. Member, you heard the question to adjourn the House. All those in favor indicate aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried. This House stands adjourned until 1 p.m. this afternoon.